Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration, and information on writing, publishing options, and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint, and lots more information at thecreativepen.com. And that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 488 of the podcast and it is Friday the 8th of May 2020 as I record this on day 46 of lockdown here in the UK. So today I have an interview on how to write great stories with Larry Brooks. We talk about the four criteria for a great story and the eight steps for a great story premise, as well as why emotional resonance is so important. Larry really goes into some great details, so I know you're going to find this useful today. In publishing news, Findaway Voices releases the Headphone Report, a look at 2019 audiobook data, including growth in retail and library partners that helped drive huge gains. Uh, 264% growth in library borrows and retail had 600% growth. Uh, And it's not just the US, they say in India, India grew more than 7,000% in 2019. Now, with these with these big growth percentages, what you have to remember is it's from a very small base. <laughs> but still, that is really encouraging. And it talks about the uh, how audio is really expanding across the world. They also mention that literary fiction, which is usually a much smaller genre, uh, has grown nearly 800%. And obviously, the big genres like fantasy and science fiction and mystery continue to grow. But um, Uh, When you're seeing those big numbers, it's quite exciting because it means listeners in those genres have started listening more. So that's exciting. Uh, What else? Last week, I talked about Mills and Boone developing a subscription model for romance. And this week, more examples of publishers starting to change their business model. Now, I mentioned last week how this is going to happen really fast now. I feel like publishers have not had to do this. They have had the cushion of print publishing for many years, and now they're accelerating their change. So interestingly, Faber and Faber are very literary and uh, they do poetry and literary books, but they are moving forward very quickly. I do like um, their, uh, I think he's CEO, Stephen Page. I've heard him speak. He's very good. So this is quite exciting. So Faber has partnered with digital services company, The Firsty Group, to supply Faber factory content for Glassbox, the direct-to-consumer sales app. So this is really interesting. So Faber are putting their eBooks available for purchase through an app. And uh, they, this um, service, Glassbox, does have a way to integrate into a publisher's website and enables um, buy now links in social media and stuff like that, which is what I've been talking about for a while and which some indie authors have done. To be fair, not many indie authors have done direct sales because I don't think, again, they've needed to, but times might be changing. And I know many of you are looking at the direct model. So this is interesting that um, Faber are doing this. And uh, I'm going to link to, again, all the links in the show notes. This is from the bookseller. I actually got quite a lot from the bookseller this week. Uh, So on Selling Direct, obviously I've talked before about my own way. I use Payhip, uh, but I know that's not relevant for everybody. Uh, Several of you have said that there are different tax rules in other countries. And of course, Payhip deals with the EU VAT. But um, if you want to do other things, the Alliance of Independent Authors has posted a really good article about all the different ways you can sell direct. I'm going to link to that in the show notes, but you can go to selfpublishingadvice.org and they have a thing on selling books on your author website. So yeah, I think this is something that everyone's realising they need to do because even if you're not dependent on print book sales, you may well be dependent on one retailer for ebooks and they will have even more power after this is over. And so that may mean more changes to come. So it's good to protect your uh, income, but also it's about having that data, the data from customers, you know who's buying your books and you can develop a much closer relationship. What else? 
Also, the bookseller reports that, quote, small presses fear being wiped out by autumn. Now, this is in the UK. Uh, I haven't really seen any reports from other countries, but I've got to assume that it's the same. It says a significant proportion of the UK and Ireland's smallest independent presses say their businesses are at risk as a result of lockdown, seeing sales plunge and cash run out. We are likely to struggle after September and into 2021 as cash will start to run out. 57%, which is incredible to me, uh, said they had no cash flow to support the business going forward. Uh, 86% have had to cancel events. 18% said they could no longer offer advances, while 25% said they could not afford to take on new titles. And I absolutely want these presses to survive. I do not like to see this type of thing. None of us do. We are book people, as I've been saying the last few weeks. We want the publishing industry industry to thrive. And I think there's room for all of us, whatever model you choose to publish and also whatever model you choose to sell. But everyone is responsible for their own business. And this is a show for authors. <laughs> so I wanted to take this article and reframe it for you. If you are an author who has been published by a small press, or even not a small press, even a slightly bigger press, or even a big publisher, have you checked your reversion clauses for your um, books? And remember episode 473 with Rebecca Giblin, when we talked about these clauses, and she said there are lots of contracts that don't even have these clauses. So for example, if you're published by one of these small presses that goes um, bust, what happens to your book? Is there automatic reversion of that contract? Or do you have to get some kind of permission from them, even if their company's gone under? And let's face it, they're probably not going to be thinking about you (laughs) at that point. Uh, Or will your books be piled up into their balance sheet and used to offset any assets or to recruit debts by any other companies. And that is absolutely what happens with many of these um, companies. So I would suggest you check your contracts. If you have signed with any publisher for any book, what have you signed away? What will happen if they struggle or even if they fail to keep the contract? So let's, um, it said there, Uh, 18% said they could no longer offer advances and 57% had no cash flow. So it's not just about advances, it would be payment of royalties. On non-payment of royalties, do you get the rights back? Can you start independently publishing? All of these things are really important to consider because uh, as much as you, we all care about the publishing industry and we care about books uh, and we care about these companies, at the end of the day, they if they go under, you don't want to go under with them. So no one cares about your long-term success as much as you do. That's just the truth of it. So um, this is your intellectual property asset. This is your career. So value yourself and value your creative work and go check your contracts. <laughs> and then of course, I. it's funny, I we all go day to day, we go from, oh, I can manage this, I'm going to get used to this new normal. And, and then other days, we're just like, oh, I'm really over this, just want this to stop. <laughs> In fact, I um, I fell over this week, I tripped up a step and kind of threw my dinner all over the room and, uh, you know, had to sit on the ground and had a bit of a cry. And then I thought, I mean, no, I'm not really crying because I just hurt my knee. Just having a bit of a cry in general. And uh, I felt better afterwards. But it was just one of those days when I just was like, oh, where is life gone? And it's it's not just, you know, I feel very grateful and absolutely. And I realized many of you have emailed me and said, you're in a really great position. You get to walk along the canal. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I am very lucky. I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for my situation. But... <laughs> You know, things are difficult for everybody. And I just thought I'd share that I have bad days too. I try not to bring my bad days onto the show, but uh, I thought I'd share that. Um, I have learned to make a lot of tasty soup in this lockdown, and uh, which is good because the Financial Times in the UK reported today that the British economy is likely to have the worst recession in 300 years. <laughs> I read that this morning and went, oh, great, that's really positive. <laughs> But what it did, all of that, I want to just come back to the publishing side and being in control of our assets and being able to make money in other ways. What I'm 
feel very much is this is not a short term thing. This is not just going to bounce back in June or July or August. Um, This may well go on for a while in terms of the economic impact, just, you know, the health impact I can't even comment on because I don't know enough about that. Um, We have to listen to the experts. But in terms of publishing, I I feel like I've got a good enough handle to know that this is going to go on a while. (laughs) So yeah, please check your contracts. Please think about how you are going to continue your business uh, over the next year um, in difficult times. But I don't want to be a downer about it. You know, I'm a very positive person. And what I think is that we're going to come out of this with a much more resilient business model. And that's why I wanted to talk about Faber there, because I'm super impressed by some of the things they're doing to shore up their business. And Faber is one of the oldest um, publishers here. And uh, I think that's off the top of my head, but, you know, they're pretty... um, they're they're sort of held up in the British industry. They're a very reputable publisher. And it's great to see them really reinventing a lot of their digital side in order to surf the change, which I have been talking about for a while. So yeah, let's take this and reframe it as, okay, how am I going to make my business more resilient? How am I going to make my life more resilient? What can I do to put things in place for the long term? So on my personal update, uh, I am still editing Map of the Impossible and I had to do a total rejig of the final third of the book as my timelines were out. So I have these different uh, groups, two main groups of characters who are going to meet in the same place at the same time. And I, I had written various things that meant their timelines were completely out of whack and if you read the read the book it will mean that they're not in the same place at the same time and for one it was the daytime and the other one it was the nighttime and oh so annoying and it makes me much more determined to get to grips with plotting now I'm a discovery writer and there's nothing wrong with being a discovery writer it's great it's really fun but this just was, I was just tearing my hair out because I had to change so much to figure out the whole where people should be when. (laughs) And I need to learn to do things earlier in the process so that I don't have that frustration later on. Many of the most successful fiction authors are plotters and to use elements of plotting, even if that's just a one pager. And um, I was listening to Jonathan Mabry Uh, who's one of my favourite authors uh, last weekend or the week uh, time disappears last weekend let's say and he was talking about his his plots and they are very simple they're kind of one or two pages they're not complicated so I don't have to become Jeffrey Deaver and write almost a whole book length of an outline (laughs) I think I just want to make my process better. And I'm very encouraged by the changes I've made with coronavirus, as I mentioned in the interview with Mark McGuinness or the week after Mark McGuinness, how I was able to change my creative process and start writing at home when I've always written in the cafe. And I feel like if I can make this one change, then I can make other changes. So I'm researching how to move from discovery to plotting Also, the next Arcane book is going to be, which is going to be called Tree of Life. I don't know if I've um, mentioned that, but it's based on the Etzheim Library in Amsterdam, uh, in the Portuguese synagogue out of the library there. And uh, Etzheim is Tree of Life. And so I, why did I get into that? Yes, this is quite a complicated book with lots of settings, lots of different things happening. And I really want to try and make the process of writing that um, better. So I'm listening to Elizabeth George's audiobook at the moment on mastering the process. Uh, if you don't know her, she she writes um, mysteries. And what's interesting is the location research she does is pretty much how I do my location research in terms of going places, taking pictures, doing a lot of uh, research that way. What I then don't do at the moment is take that and write some kind of outline. I just sit down and start writing. So that's something I want to do. Uh, What else? Yes. And you'll also see that I've got some interviews coming up where I mention this kind of thing. So I wanted to give you a heads up as to why I'm I'm suddenly asking that question. (laughs) Basically, I want to become a better writer. It really is. When I think about the 2020s, this decade, I want 
you know, my 2010s have very much been around learning a lot and going full time and developing my business and all the things that are really useful to do. But my business is pretty stable and like I do the podcast, I do, um, you know, I do some videos, I have email, I do my nonfiction, uh, but my fiction is what I want to spend my 2020s on. So becoming a better writer is my overarching thing at the moment. Uh, I also did a little Facebook Live this week. So essentially, I'm changing the way I have the creativepen.com. It's going to be primarily podcast content, and then I'm going to do live videos as well. Uh, So I did a little Facebook Live on what my edit involved, and then I'm posting those videos, obviously, once I've stopped the live. I post the video on YouTube and also on the blog with a transcript. So that the first one is up from this week. I want to do more live because I can't show my face at various events and it might be a while until we can. So I'm going to be doing more regular Facebook lives for both fiction and non-fiction. I'm going to try and do some fiction ones, although I haven't actually done one yet because I'm a bit nervous. (laughs) But um, I will be doing a Creative Pen Facebook Live on Friday 15th of May at 4pm UK, 11am US Eastern. So that will be on facebook.com forward slash the creative pen. I will be answering questions on anything to do with writing and publishing and book marketing and all of that. So that's Friday 15th of May at 4pm UK, 11am US Eastern. And uh, of course, that the replay uh, will be available in all the usual places. Also coming up on the 11th of June, and you'll want to get this into the calendar, that's why I'm bringing it up early, I'm hosting a new webinar, so this is new material with Mark Dawson, who's also bringing along an ex-Amazon insider uh, to talk about the latest information on Amazon ads. It will include how to start off small and scale up effectively, whether ad relevance or the highest bid is more important, how to develop key learnings on what works for your books, and simplicity is often the key to a successful Amazon ad. So they will be talking about that. You can join us, thecreativepen.com forward slash 11 June. So 1 1 June. Um, Links in the show notes and that will be 4 p.m. US Eastern, 9 p.m. UK, a bit later than we usually do. So thecreativepen.com forward slash 11 June. So thanks for all your emails and tweets and comments this week. I really appreciate them. Thanks to Anita in South Africa, who sent a picture from across the creek that feeds the wetland for the bird sanctuary, which just is wonderful, brings up wonderful imagery. And uh, I saw the pictures, you lot didn't, but <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, Corey said, great podcast today with Matty. It's like receiving permission to write short fiction when so often it feels unjustified from a marketability perspective. Indeed. Uh, BB Tita said, to show you the power of podcasts, I just bought an ebook version of your interviewee's book on Amazon. Yes, podcasting does sell books, people. Uh, and then, oh, Chloe, Chloe on YouTube, who actually said um, she'd found episode 381, which is Michael Brent Collings talking about writing with depression and anxiety. And Chloe says, thanks for making this. I've suffered in the past and will say I rarely feel them nowadays because I have a system that's worked for me. This is an important podcast for anyone suffering from mental illness. It helps you not to feel alone. And uh, that interview with Michael Brent is one of the most popular shows, episode 381. If you need it or pass it on to anyone else, I realise that mental health at the lock time of lockdown is actually pretty bad for some people. So that might help as well. And finally, uh, Verla says on Twitter, every Monday morning here in Manitoba, you and your guests help me think about things in a new way. Today's episode gave me ideas like trying a short non-fiction audiobook on Findaway, uplifting as usual. Thank you, Verla. And thanks to everyone um, for emails and tweets. You can tweet me at the creative pen with a double N and send me pictures. I love pictures, especially as I can't travel right now. Um, I keep saying to Jonathan, we're going to go here next and we're going to go here when probably what we'll do is uh, maybe go to Bristol, (laughs) which is just down the road. (laughs) Oh dear. Yes, you have to laugh. Otherwise you end up crying. (laughs) 
<laughs> so today's show is sponsored by Kovo Writing Life. And as ever, I'm a huge fan of KWL. They are truly my widest publisher. I just checked my KWL map uh, in preparation for this. I've now sold books in 151 countries through Kobo, which is pretty exciting. That's I think they sell in 190 countries. So oh, hell, I'm almost there, which is quite exciting. My goal is to sell books in every single country that Kobo um distribute to. So if you're in any country (laughs) that is unusual, I I guess what I should do is identify the countries that I've got left and then give that a shout on the podcast. That's that's probably what I need to do. Uh, In fact, KWL team, that's what I need to know. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, Tara and Christine will share a tip for you in a minute. This type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating this show is sponsored by my patrons. Thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. I really appreciate it. And particularly there's a a bumper crop this week. So I feel like I am being useful in your coronavirus experience. So I really appreciate this. Thanks to everyone who's been supporting the show for years and months. And also thanks to new patrons. Ansela Corsino, Emily Jorgensen or Jorgensen, Tari Akpodietti, I really hope I got that right, Tari, Graham Dinton, JD Russell, Eni Tuo Misalo. Oh, that Tuo Misalo really sounds Finnish. I have been to Finland. It's a great country. Um, Katrina O'Sullivan, The Crypto Woman and Laurel Mildred. Thank you so much for your support. It demonstrates you enjoy the show and want it to continue. And you can uh, be a patron of the show, just a couple of dollars a month and you get the extra audio uh, and you get to join the Q&A. And I've started being much more communicative on Patreon uh, these days. So hopefully that is useful. You can support the show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kobo Writing Life and then we'll get into the interview. Hi, I'm Stephanie. And I'm Tara. And we're from Kobo Writing Life. Kobo's free, fast and easy self-publishing platform. KWL was built by authors for authors. And our team of dedicated book lovers is always working hard to help authors reach new readers around the world. And with that in mind, we want to tell you about how KWL authors can reach library readers. Right now, digital books are reaching more people than ever, and libraries are becoming an integral part of that. In 2019 alone, top digital library systems powered by Overdrive surpassed 174 million checkouts. This means a lot of happy library readers. You can easily add your book to Overdrive's library system through Kobo Writing Life. All you need to do is go to the rights and distribution section of your book, click yes to Overdrive and enter a library price. Your book will then be available to librarians to purchase for multi-loan use, but also for one-time checkout option. And you'll earn 50% on every library sale. If you're not too sure what price you should set for your book, we recommend roughly the same price as a mass market paperback. Your book could be loaned out several times, which is why we encourage pricing higher than your normal ebook. And don't forget to tell your readers that they can now pick up your book in libraries. If you're interested in taking part in library promotions, email our team at writinglife at kobo.com and we'll add you to our mailing list. If you want to learn more about Kobo Writing Life, check out our blog, podcast, and find us on social. You can create your free account at kobo.com slash writinglife. Back to you, Joanna. Larry Brooks is the best-selling author of psychological thrillers as well as books for authors, including story engineering and story physics. His latest book is Great Stories Don't Write Themselves, Criteria-Driven Strategies for More Effective Fiction. Welcome back to the show, Larry. Hey, thanks for having me, Joanna. This is great. Oh, yeah, it's great to have you back. And it's actually been a while since you've been on the show. So tell us a bit about you and your writing background for anyone who doesn't know. Sure. Well, I'm probably older than most of the people listening here. I, I you know, it, at least it feels that way sometime. I, I started writing uh, with the intention of publishing in the 70s, and I was an overnight success beginning in 1999. So it took <laughs> it, it took that long to get something published. Although I was making a living writing corporate uh, marketing and training stuff the whole time, 
which is its own sort of torment because you spend all day writing stuff for clients that you really don't want to write and kind of in the back of your head, your new novels kicking around and uh, it's kind of distracting. So when we sold the company and I had the opportunity to kind of chuck all that and write fiction, I did that. And uh, so I published, I wrote and published uh, six novels over a few years and gee, nobody wanted to interview me on the radio much for that. That's not completely true. I, I, I did a little PR and you know, kicking around and stuff. But um, my publisher dropped me, which is a pretty common thing. It was Penguin Putnam at the time after four novels in four years. And then I had to scramble and my agent had to scramble. And I ended up with a small publisher. And then things slowed down, and I thought, what am I going to do with this slowdown? So a friend of mine's son was big into the digital world and got me started blogging. And the only thing I was qualified to blog about, I think, was writing books. So uh, I was pretty opinionated about that and had a lot to say. So in, the, the blog started in 2009, and then in 2011, I collected most of those posts and I smoothed the edges out and turned it into a narrative nonfiction um, called Story Engineering, which, to my delight and surprise, kind of took off. When we say take something in nonfiction takes off, it's way different than a novel taking off. It's a much smaller thing because it takes off in a niche, takes off in its own little neighborhood, whereas a novel can take off globally when it happens. That didn't happen to me, by the way, but um, the novel, the, the, the story engineering book did well, so it launched me down a path of continuing to blog and, and uh, teaching writing at conferences, um, mostly around the country, but a few international gigs, and I've, I've written four of them now, and the last one, Great Stories Don't Write Themselves, was published this last November, by ironically, well, it was Writer's Digest Books, that's still the imprint, but Writer's Digest was acquired by Penguin Random House. <laughs> so that, that, that beginning of Penguin Putnam, and then here I am, and now I'm a Penguin Random House writer. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's actually really funny, and a real tale yeah. of publishing over, yes, it is. over years of, of uh, acquiring. And I, I remember us meeting, because my blog started in, my podcast started in 2009, and, and my blog uh -huh. just a bit before that, and we met uh, online when you were doing Story Fix, and your book, Story Engineering, I'll just tell everyone, I mean, they can. I'll point back to the original show when we talked about it, but I learned how to write a scene from that book. Well, that's nice to hear. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's a it is a great book. I also wanted to tell you that last weekend I read Whisper of the Seventh Thunder. Oh my! So uh, one of your novels because I'm yes. into uh, religious thrillers, and I was like, oh, it's Bible Cody. <laughs> yes, it is definitely Bible Cody. <laughs> So I just wanted to let you know that because uh, it was it was funny. I was like, oh, I'm going to just get recheck out Larry's books. Yeah. And well, there I, you go. I, I, I hope you enjoyed it. That book took 27 years to write. <laughs> I, had, I, I literally had the idea for that 27 years earlier and just po procrastinated and pondered and was kind of worried about the implications of messing with that topic having read it you know what i'm talking about mm. and uh really i actually consulted with priests and spiritualists and a minister and wiser people than me about should i mess with this and some of them said no you shouldn't and so being a little feisty i said well okay I, i'm gonna go do it and <laughs> Uh, that that happened. So yeah, unfortunately, it didn't get banned by the Vatican. <laughs> it didn't. I didn't get any attention from the Vatican at I all. Know. Which... Well, neither did I with any of mine. So yeah, that's unfortunate. <laughs> but um, yeah. okay, let's get into the latest book. Um, so sure. I think it's really interesting, and I'm, I'm going to read a couple of the quotes as we go through. But you say not all story ideas are good or even viable, and too many writers are committing to too many weak story ideas, which is like. Okay, then. <laughs> so, yes. so I think this is really good advice. So how do we know, though, when a story idea is strong enough or if a story idea is too weak? Well, it, it is a, a fabulously germane, important, urgent question for all of us because none of us sit down and say to ourselves, hey, I've got this idea and it's really mediocre. So I think I'm going to sit down and I'm going to spend a year of my life writing up this mediocre idea into a novel. We don't think that way. We all think our ideas are worthy and they fascinate us. 
And so that's, that's the thing that moves us toward the blank page and we start to write. But there's a couple of things that new writers uh, need to learn or inevitably will learn the longer they take care of this. And that is that while this is fun and while this is personal and it's an outlet and it's, you know, uh, a pressure reliever and all the things we want to think our writing is, when you seek to publish, you're hanging out a shingle in effect and you're, you're announcing that I'm now a professional. I'm in this business. And like any business, you are uh, creating a service and a, a product, if you will, for a market, for an audience. So the fact that you were really intrigued with your idea when you start a project may or may not translate to something that the market's going to agree with, that, oh, I love this idea. And the data proves this out. In my book, I cite a statistic that was quoted by the Huffington Post, but it's an, a, a statistic that kind of floats around in, in actual specificity, but you can find this data in all kinds of places, and that is that 96% of the manuscripts submitted to agents for publication – are rejected and only four percent are ultimately accepted by a publisher now that means that some of those were accepted for representation but they never got a publisher but that's a pretty scary proportion 96 percent don't do what what you hope they'll do the dream doesn't happen and only four percent succeed and yet nobody really challenges that and i found myself as part of a writer who's writing these books and teaching the stuff out there in workshops and conferences, part of what I call the writing conversation, which is the collective noise about what's true and what should be true and what isn't true about writing, which includes not only books like I write, but, and that you write, uh, but the blogs that we write and the workshops that we give and the forums we talked on and the critique groups we belong to, and all of our friends who are also writers, and the writing conferences where there's all this buzz in the hallway and everybody's sharing their conventional wisdom about writing. Now, why would we just accept a conventional wisdom that has a 96% failure rate? And that's that got my attention. Mm. And, and I wanted to challenge that. There has to be a better way. So I started analytically talking to people at various stages of their career and their learning curve, and we need to understand that the people who repeatedly end up on a bookstore shelf, they don't experience a 96% failure rate. Those writers basically get everything published. Now, it's true that their first draft may not get published and that they may work with editors at the publishing house to finish the project to the liking of the publisher. But the 96% is really composed of, for lack of a better word, newer writer or emerging writers or frustrated writers who refuse to um, evolve their own process and their base of knowledge and they just stick with that original, well, this is my idea, and I'm sticking to it, and I don't care if you like it, I'm going to write it, and then have their heart broken when nobody does like it to the degree you do, and it, the, the agent and the publisher don't like it either, and they don't publish you. So this book is an attempt to break down the, ra the reasons and the rationale why those 96% do, in fact, fail to find an audience. And we have to factor in the fact that uh, so many new books now are self-published as well. But the criteria is exactly the same. It really chaps me when we I hear people go, well, I don't, I don't have to follow any of these principles because I'm going to self-publish and I can just do it any way I want to. When in fact, the criteria that makes a story work and the high bar at which we must execute those criteria is exactly the same for a self-published author seeking to grow an audience as it is for an author aspiring to land an agent and end up in a traditional publishing situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're right about that. And uh, I, I mean, obviously, it's very easy to publish now, but it yes. is not easy 
to find an audience. It's not easy to be, in quotation marks, successful as an author. Um, and in fact, even if you are published, it doesn't guarantee by, by a publisher, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to be successful. It doesn't guarantee a particular level of income and it doesn't guarantee prizes or anything like that. Right. But I think, you know, let's agree that um, with the listeners, we all want to write a really good story. And uh, it's interesting, you said evolve the process. And I mean, I've written at this point now 17 novels. I've actually, I'm having a gin and tonic, as I mentioned to you, because I just printed <laughs> out the first draft of my next uh, novel, Map of the Impossible. And I want to write better stories. And uh -huh. I want to be a better writer. I want to evolve my process. And so let's get into the book. So one of the things you say is concept is the secret source of story selection. So right. what is concept? I mean, people might have heard high concept, but um, let's talk about concept. Sure. That's a, that's a great question. And before I do that, I just want to circle back and finish the idea question because you, you asked about what constitutes a great idea, and I really never answered that. In the book, the theory of this new book is that I've broken the entirety of – what a novel is and what it has to do down into 16 categories or buckets, the most early of which is the story idea. And then for all 16 of those areas, I've, I've um, defined criteria that are, you have to lose, use the word criteria a little loosely, but they're principle-driven criteria that say, if you do this, it will serve you. If you don't do this, it may hurt you. So, for example, with idea, there's four criteria offered in the book. And the first one is that the, the idea leans into a dramatic intention or a dramatic proposal as opposed to simply an observing thing or a documentary type of, of, of story. You know, what I did on my summer vacation may not have a shred of drama in it. And yet people write novels about that kind of thing all the time. Here's the novel of my summer in Venice. Without any drama, it's just a documentary of what they did. So that criteria for your idea really uh, elevates it if you come up with a dramatic level to it. Another one is uh, a vision for the character and the worldview and how they're going to behave in a situation, going back to number one, the dramatic situation, into which you're going to thrust your character. Who is that person and how will they respond? You need a notion of that and it, it becomes context within your idea. The third criteria is there's a sense of thematic and emotional resonance to it. So, for example, your summer vacation in Venice may, may not mean anything to a huge portion of the potential reading public out there. They don't care about Venice. They don't want to go to Venice. It's important to you, but it's not important to anybody else. So the idea should touch on things that people can relate to and empathize with, and we put your hero into a situation where we not only can relate to it, we root for them. We don't want to just watch them. We need we emotionally root for them on whatever that journey is. And the final one is that there's some sense of how the story will unfold, which is kind of a that that. The slope of that is exactly the same as your learning curve. The more we learn about a, how a story is built, the more we kind of intuitively sense at the idea stage how it can unfold. So with those as the basic criteria for an idea, and getting back to your question about concept, it's true that you can actually meet all four of those ideas, or those criteria, and come up with a perfectly vanilla, been there, done that, not all that compelling story premise. So what do we do then? And the answer is, if the first delineation is, are you writing what is by intention a literary novel? Or are you writing a genre or a mashup of genres or a commercial novel? The room divides depending on your answer. Because... When we say we are writing a commercial novel, which by definition becomes some sort of genre or combination of genres, it's a mystery, it's a thriller, it's a paranormal, it's, it's a historical or whatever those genres are, the, the word genre should be synonymous with conceptual. So in other words, you have a premise, which I'm going to talk about in a minute because that's kind of the heart of this whole book. 
there's eight criteria for a great premise, but the premise, you can meet all eight criteria and still not have anything conceptual. So here's an example, Joanna. A story about a kid who grows up and he's very talented and he decides to fight crime and evil in his small town and he's successful of it and he starts uh, going out and saving the world. That's your idea. Well, every detective, everybody who wants to be a policeman, that's everybody's dream who wants to get into that business. There's nothing conceptual about it. So what can you add to that idea that is conceptual? The definition of concept being something that isn't the plot, but that becomes a framework for the plot or the story or the character in such a way that it flavors the story in a certain way. So when I give you this example, you'll see that right away. Take that same kid who grows up and he wants he's talented and he wants to save the world. And the author goes, well, what can I bring to this that nobody's ever seen before? Let's say it's 1936, because you're going to recognize this right away. <laughs> Let's say that character actually arrived on Earth in a crashing spaceship. A really nice couple in rural Kansas finds him. He's still alive. They raise this child because he appears to be human. But he actually ends up with all these very superhuman uh, traits and abilities, and they raise him well to appreciate good versus evil and want to help others. And he realizes that he's very super. And his mother takes that to the next extent and makes him a costume. And suddenly this kid is actually Superman. And everything about Superman aligns with that original story idea that I just pitched to you. A kid grows up and he realizes he has talents and he wants to go fight evil and maybe save the world which isn't conceptual until you put a suit on him and let him fly and you create this amazing backstory and you do so within a genre that allows you to be that far out there. And you've got probably the most iconic genre character slash hero ever created along with Sherlock Holmes, who is conceptual. Batman is conceptual. Um, Janet Ivanovich is uh, characters. Uh, Stephanie Plum is conceptual. So if you can bring something conceptual to the, to the character or to the story world, a world in which time travel is possible, that's conceptual. You're still writing a love story. You're still writing a mystery of some or a thriller, right? But when you add time travel to the mix, it becomes conceptual. Now, some people will say, well, that's easy if you're in science fiction or paranormal or something like that. How do you be conceptual within a romance or a mystery thriller, which is, I'll grant you, harder to be conceptual? Well, if you've got a love story about going back to Kansas, not picking on Kansas here, but it's kind of, it's, it's, it's good old uh, salt of the earth farmland with really great people. It's not highly conceptual in any regard in that sense. But about two people that grow up on neighboring farms in Kansas and they fall in love, that's not really conceptual. So how do you make that more conceptual? Well, instead of two farmers falling in love in Kansas, how about two people that work for the president's staff in the White House fall in love amidst a policy of no fraternization in the White House in full view of the entire nation? But they're falling in love. That's a conceptual layer that you bring to the story. And when you begin to wrap your head around what concept is and the, 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 the upside of it, you can see how just about any story can be rendered more conceptual. And if you go look at the stories that, other than bestsellers who are down the road that can really publish anything, the concept actually is their name. You know, The next novel by... Uh, Nora Roberts is a concept. Nora Roberts is a concept. You want to see the next Nora Roberts book if mm. you're a fan. Mm. That's a concept, and that's the definition of concept. The, the best definition, the succinct definition of concept is you pitch the concept to someone, but it doesn't tell them anything about the actual plot, and the, the listener goes, wow, that sounds really cool. I want to I hear that. I want to hear about a love story that takes place in the White House. Yeah. And there's no story yet. Yes. And I think this is why fiction is a lot harder than people think. 
<laughs> like yes. I, I feel that when uh, this is why it's a lifetime's journey, I think, to be a fiction author because there's always something more to try and something more to learn. Um, so you've given us some great stuff there. We've got the four points about the story. We've got the concept. Now, um, a couple of things I want to pick up on. So you mentioned the premise. So yes. we'll, we'll come to that, and then I also want to come back to um, emotional resonance. So let should we do premise first? Because I think yes. a lot of people the word premise is bandied around by so many people and in fact if you look it up on the internet it it, it has so many different definitions it is ridiculous <laughs> yes. so give us your take on premise sure well if you want to go english teacher formal about it that the root word of premise is to presume so there's a presumption of something that exists in your story and that's when you're you're putting forth a premise and you're absolutely right joanna this word is mashed together with the word concept, sometimes theme, and by book reviewers, by other authors, by agents, they don't differentiate it in a way that allows the writer to understand that those three things are different. Premise, concept, and theme are all three different things. They work together, they combine, but they're not the same thing. So when one of those folks in the casual conversation says, well, the theme of the book, and then they turn around and tell you the plot, uh, that's not actually an astute way to say it. They mean well. They're just simply giving you a, an elevator pitch. An elevator pitch, by the way, can be a premise, or it can be a concept, or it can be a theme. The help. Uh, I'm going to write a story about racial tensions in 1962 Jackson, Mississippi. Well, there's no story there yet. It's just a theme. But it's a conceptual theme because there's so much emotional resonance in the – as soon as you say racial tensions in 1962 Deep South USA, the themes just scream out at you. So it's already alive with something conceptual because a theme can be conceptual, a character can be conceptual, a plot proposition can be conceptual. So – it's good if the writer can understand, gee, if I have to do all three of those things, let me understand all three of them separate from the other two, each one separate from the other two, which brings us full circle back to premise. Premise is, in fact, synonymous with story, synonymous with plot. Um, a lot of times when we pitch something, we leave out a lot of the eight elements of a premise, and the pitch can be successful, just like that pitch on Superman. Alien kid crashes, raised by human parents, goes on to have superpowers and save the world from evil. That's a pitch. A lot of people go, if they haven't heard it, by the way, there's been over 500 published stories and television shows on that one pitch. <laughs> it's kind of proven. Um but it isn't a complete premise yet. So let's let's take that. Let's do a different show, and I'll sh I'll show you how this this plays out. Remember the TV show Castle? Yes. Ran, yes. Uh, a few years or I seven that. years. Mm. Yeah. He's a, the, the the protagonist is a novelist, lives in New York City, and he's friends with the mayor. Might be the chief of police. I'm not sure which. Doesn't matter. But they offer him a gig as a consultant with the a precinct of the New York City Police Department to come in and use his analytical crime-solving skill that he's demonstrated as a novelist, like inviting James Patterson to come in and be a consultant to this precinct to help them think outside the box. Meanwhile, he gets to see real-life cases that he can use and leverage and turn into his novels. It's a win-win proposition. That is a concept. There's no plot there yet. It's just a concept. And yet, over seven seasons, there was 174 episodes of Castle, which means there was 174 unique, separate, and different premises, because it told 174 different stories from that one concept. So it's the strength of the concept that fueled the ongoing success of that series, and yet every one of them is different. So... Let me run through the eight criteria for a premise, because a premise really is the pitch line further developed and finished into a holistic description of a story. There's eight criteria. The first criteria is we meet a protagonist before the sky falls on them, which implies the sky does need to fall on them. 
They say that it's not a story until something goes wrong. That's especially true in genre fiction. But we have to we meet the story before they are fully engaged with whatever problem you're going to put in front of them. It could start out partially underway, but they don't fully understand or are exposed to the full scope of what they have to go out and do. The second criteria is something happens that changes everything for that protagonist. And that usually isn't on page six. It's usually around page 60 to 80. And it's when after a bunch of setup, what I call the first quartile, where we meet the protagonist, we begin to seed the forthcoming plot. We begin to explore the story world. And we begin to understand what this protagonist will have at stake in this story. With all that in place, something happens. In Castle, it's the phone rings and there's a murder uptown. And he has to go with the squad down there. And oh, by the way, the murdered guy's a priest. That's the sky falling. That's this moment where everything changes for the protagonist. The third criteria is that the hero is compelled to react to a calling from whatever that sky falling inciting moment is. They have to go. They have to run from it to save their life, or they have to go save somebody else quickly, or they have to seek out information before it happens again, or they have to engage with an enemy who is challenging to and, and threatening everything. But that third thing needs to be there. There has to be something to react to, and they are compelled to engage and react even if it doesn't seem like a reaction other than just running like hell to save themselves, because that's often the case in, within a premise, because the hero's in danger all of a sudden and they have to run. Um, the fourth criteria is there are stakes in play. This can't be the, uh, the stakes are that my daughter lost her, her term paper on the bus on the way to school. Those aren't really big global stakes that a huge readership is going to react to. There needs to be stakes that the hero ultimately will, it's what the hero is playing for. It's the win or lose proposition of whatever you're asking the hero to do in the story. And right there is where a lot of new writers depart from the wisdom of this because they're writing a story that's a documentary that says, watch my hero on his summer vacation. It's really cool. (laughs) And nothing really happens to the hero. That hero isn't called out of that pre-event life to engage with something or run from something or save somebody or because there's no stakes yet. So the stakes are important for for the story to work because the stakes are what the reader is going to relate to emotionally. And that's when you get the reader. When they can feel the weight of those stakes, they're, not, they're going to empathize with this whole situation and they're going to root for your hero to fix this or to save themselves or to save the other person or to save the city or to save the world. That's basically, in essence, what that means. So when the hero reacts and there are stakes in play, the fifth criteria is something opposes the hero, opposition, obstacle, in that quest to right the wrong, save people, turn this problem around, solve the problem, whatever it looks like, something stands in the hero's way. It isn't just a clean path. Like right now, we're living a huge hero's quest where all of these wonderful medical professionals are trying to solve a huge problem, and there's a virus that will not be defeated standing in their way. So it really becomes... Hero entity A against antagonist entity B, usually in genre in the form of a villain or a group of villains, that that's where the fight, it becomes kind of a one-on-one entity versus entity proposition that describes the arc of what the hero is doing to solve this problem. Because ultimately, that's what a story is. Hero has a problem. Hero has to solve the problem, has to confront the problem, defeat the problem, and uh, minimize or reverse the threat or the negative consequences had they not won. When the hero is opposed, we bring us down to uh, criteria number six, where the story needs to escalate. It can't be an even thing. It has to twist and escalate, which is a function of the writer's understanding of how story structure works. 
It isn't linear. It isn't easy. And it, there are highs and lows and lulls and, re, and reveals and breakthroughs. The seventh criteria is that the hero's state of play, the hero's character arc, if you will, the hero has to learn from what they're being exposed to. They have to encounter inner demons and habits and fears that might be stopping them. And they have to conquer those things. They have to learn as they go about the antagonist and about the situation so that they can adapt to ultimately, because what the hero's doing early in the story isn't working. That's that's that level thing I was talking about. Mm. The hero isn't going to win right away. Things are going to get worse before they get better. And then the hero has to turn that around. And they do that by understanding what wasn't working and why and suddenly start trying different things. And then the eighth criteria is that the hero has to be the key catalyst in the resolution of the story. The hero isn't an observer to the resolution. The hero doesn't get injured and go to the hospital and someone else finishes the work and solves the problem. That won't work. It's the hero resolves this whole thing somehow, maybe not completely, maybe maybe not completely happily, but they vanquish whatever the problem is, whatever the villain was agenda was, and they the world returns often to a new normal, if not the old normal. Those are the eight blocks of a, of, a, of a premise that works. And when we analyze a story by a new writer and you start to dig into these eight things, you will often find that not necessarily a new writer, but a, a, any writer who's had a story rejected or it isn't working, you'll find that in this diagnosis resides in one or more of those eight things either being com missing completely or too weak, or not emotionally resonant. Mm. Wow, you've given us loads, Larry, and uh, we're actually <laughs> we're actually almost out of time. So I'm I'm going to ask one more question because okay. I think that emotional response, that emotional resonance. I feel uh, that many indie writers, many writers, have good idea for plot, and what you outlined right. there. You know, it's a kind of the hero's journey type of thing, and that people can fit those to plot but what is often right. missing is the depth in the writing where a reader has an emotional response it doesn't have to be crying or anything but something that's right. deeper than just oh here's another fight scene um that might that is a very difficult thing for many people to write so right. uh what are your tips for the emotional resonance well that's another great question, and it's actually, you know, when we go back to that horrible fraction, 96% don't get there and 4% do, and we try to explain, it isn't as simple as, well, the 96% hit all eight of those things, and the 96% can write really solid narrative prose. Yes, yes, and yes, but the real reason that that 4% works is that the nature of the problem that you've asked your hero to engage with is something that the reader can feel. So let's look at a ridiculous premise like Superman or Batman. There is no Superman. There is no Batman. But when Batman is trying to stop an evil villain in his gang who want to poison the water supply of an entire city and kill all the children and basically decimate civilization in a region of the United States, that is something that anybody with a pulse is going to want stopped. So you create a story world that gives you permission to have these fantastical elements, but then the story translates to reality in terms of the reader feels it. They not only feel the urgency of the need, they feel the weight of the stakes, and they, they can feel what that would be like if something really happened there. So if somebody writes a novel about this coronavirus we're dealing with right now, and it's about a doctor who has a solution, but nobody will believe her, and her fight is to get her solution into the right hands so that it can suddenly be distributed widely, but for political reasons, they're not listening to her. Can't you feel that already And me just saying that? We root for this doctor. We understand that this doctor is important. And unless she achieves this goal, the story goal you've given her, bad stuff's going to happen to all of us because we're, that's in our lives right now. So that's an example I just, just sparked right now because it's something we can all relate to.
even though the story is really about one doctor, one chemist, who came across something that doesn't seem like it would work, but it does, and she has to take it forward and get it out there. But there's big pharmaceutical companies that want that chunk of business, and they're trying to stop her. See where the story starts to layer in? But it's all based on the reader feeling the need and rooting for her, not just watching her, rooting for her to succeed in this quest that you've given. And that's the magic of emotional resonance. It's really the degree to which the reader cares about the, the, the hero and what you've asked them to do. Because the stakes are something they can relate to and emotionally uh, feel and fear, if you will. Yeah, and I think we see this in a lot of the Hollywood blockbusters um, that, you know, have lots of effects, but they sure. don't necessarily have the emotional resonance that we want. And that's right. why they then um, fall apart. And although I, I pick up on, uh, like, I, I, I love these big action movies, to be honest. And the, the last Avengers movie where they're all together and uh -huh. all, they all come together to fight, the you know, the bad guys. Um, right. And they have that scene where they're all the different types of heroes come together. Right. And I found that emotionally resonant. I mean, it's about as far right. from our life experience as possible. Sure. But these were, this is a friendship uh, resonance, a we're banding together to save the world as friends. And I think, I mean, that's one that uh, it often happens in YA books, I think, young adult right. books. Um, the Harry Potter books, I think, YA crossover and The Hunger Games. Things where friends and teams, it doesn't have to be romance. It doesn't have to be, you know, Batman, as you say. Um, but mm -hmm. I think and it, like friendship is something that's a human part of the human condition. And like as you say, right. right now we're recording this in coronavirus. We can't even see our friends. We can't see our family. And right. so you feel that. So that's what you're saying, right? It needs to, even if it's a most fantastical story, if it's rooted in real human emotion, then that will right. resonate. Yeah. Heroes who will give up their life for their friends or to achieve a global enemy that has to be stopped at any cost. That's the emotional key to the Avengers. It's also the key to every romance story. Someone will do what they have to do to make this relationship work without it harming the person they're in love with by taking you both forward in a way that you can be together uh, going forward after the book's over. That's, what, um, that's the emotional resonance, and it's the most common but why is that the biggest genre of all? Because it's the most common human emotion of all. It's the most common dream, the most common fantasy. Having love, having an amazing love affair that is unconditional and tested and challenged. And these people do what they have to do to make it work in spite of all the odds. Yeah, we want to write these uh, amazing stories and you've right. definitely given us some good tips and the book has lots more in. So the book is called Great Stories Don't Write Themselves. So where can people find you and everything you do online? Well, all the usual uh, online booksellers, beginning with Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, you know, the, every place that sells novels and, and books online will have this available. Um the chain bookstores will have the new one, maybe. They don't They don't get a huge buyout. It's not like the next Nora Roberts where there's 44 copies of her new book available. There's a handful of copies, and often, Lord willing, they go quickly, and it takes them a while to restock. But a bookseller can also order any of these books for anybody that's interested. The new book may be there by now, but it's it's it may not. Like any author, I do drop into Barnes & Noble to see if my book's still there. And I find out that often that about three or four months later, the small allocation is gone and they're doing a reorder. So it isn't always a sure thing, but it's easily, easily found. That may never happen again, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it. I appreciate and, and just uh, your website for people? It's storyfix.com. I'm actually in the middle of, I've got eight parts where I'm actually d taking excerpts of the book and using them as a blog post and, and embellishing them so they work as a blog post because you lift something out of a book, it may or may not work on its own. So I'm making sure that we're, but this series is going to go forward. It may end up with 40 or 50 posts in the series, but that's what I'm doing now on storyfix.com. There's over a thousand posts there. So there's all kinds of stuff. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Larry. That was great. It was my pleasure. I appreciate you inviting me, Joanna. You take care. Good luck to you. Thank you. So 
I hope you found the discussion with Larry interesting today and that you got some ideas for strengthening your own writing. So next week, I'm talking about the seven-figure or one-person creative business with Elaine Pofelt. We talk about the attitude that people running these type of businesses have in common and some ideas for moving up the income ladder. Now, I really, I read Elaine's Um, first edition of the book a while back and she's coming out with a second edition and I was like I really want to talk to her Uh, many of us you know make and this is I know I talk about some more advanced topics and this is definitely an advanced topic Uh, you know my first goal was always six figures and then you know multi six figures and uh, some some weeks I have a goal for seven figures and other weeks I don't because I feel like there are more important things but it is a goal that many people would like so that is coming up next week and remember you can join me for a Facebook live uh, on facebook.com forward slash the creative pen on Friday 15th of May and at 4pm UK 11am US Eastern links in the show notes and of course go register for the Amazon ads webinar thecreativepen.com forward slash 11 June so happy writing and I'll see you next time thanks for listening today I hope you found it helpful You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.